Today's episode of Team Class Time is about overcharge with refrigerant, okay? Overcharge with refrigerant. And so this right here is our discharge line, right? This is where we'll start with our little story. When you feed a condenser with a discharge line, wh what part of the condenser do you feed into? The top. Feed into the top. So I've always drawn this this way, and you'll see it all over the place, but really, it's kind of not ideal. So like, I should probably put, I should probably switch it, I should probably put the compressor on top and the measuring device on the bottom, and then that would kind of solve it. But I've drawn it this way so long, I just can't, I can't change. It's too, it's too, you know, it's too much, it's too much, I can't bear it. So anyway, so discharge line is made of what? Hot vapor, completely hot gas, right? Under no circumstances will it be anything other than vapor, unless, of course, the system's off and equalized, whatever. But when it's running, it's going to be hot gas, right? And we feed into our condenser. And what's the job of the condenser? To change it from a vapor to a liquid, right? So if I take more refrigerant, where do I add refrigerant into? Anybody know? Where do I put? I put it in the suction line, right? So I put it in here. This is the suction line. And do I add it with the system running or with the system off? Running. Do it with the system running in most cases. Now, can I add it with the system off? Is it possible to add refrigerant with the system off? Yes. It's, so how would I do it if I wanted to add refrigerant with the system off? You'd have to have higher pressure out of the tank than the system. Than the system, right? But under normal circumstances, if the system's off, the pressure in the tank and the pressure in the system are going to be identical, right? Make sense? So. But what, so what's the circumstance when I could do that, add refrigerant with the system off? It's got no refrigerant in it, right? And so, for example, if you've got a, this is just a quick little life tip, if you've got a system and you know it has a long line set, it's got, you know, over 50 foot line set or whatever, uh, you use the long line calculator uh, as part of the HVAC school app, so your additional, your additional line set, and you plug that in and you plug in the size of your lines and it tells you how much refrigerant to add, you can add that refrigerant with the system off before you even release the charge, right? So you can pull your vacuum, you can weigh that amount in, and then you can open your valves, and now you've already put in that exact correct amount. Make sense? It's a lot easier to add refrigerant when you're under vacuum. Yes, Sam? I saw a technician who was quite low on tank refrigerant actually block airflow to drop the suction pressure to allow him to add more refrigerant to the system. What are your thoughts on that? I'm confused. So you saw the pressure lower than the tank. Right. Well, because, oh, because the tank was getting empty? Well, OK, so there's only two reasons why tank pressure can drop. OK, what are those two reasons? One is it got cold. The tank got cold. Tank got cold, right? So you've actually put enough liquid refrigerant out of the tank that the tank's got, gotten cold, right? And what's the easiest way to improve that problem? Taking torches to it. No. <laughs> you don't take torches to it. You heat the tank, right? And generally, the easiest way to heat the tank if you're running in cooling mode is to take the tank and throw it on top of the condenser for a little bit and warm it up that way, right? Or you could use water in some cases. Usually, that would be the opposite direction. But if it's, you know, if it's really cold, you could put some, put some water out of the tap because this is Florida and our tap water's warm. Um, you could use a heat gun if you want to be real extreme. But a heating blanket is, you know, if you read EPA and all that, they'll talk about a heating blanket because we all have those on our trucks, right? You guys all got your heating blanket? You're all, all your, yeah, it's right on the list there. Your, your tank heating blanket. If you're in a norm, northern climate, um, then it is more likely that you're going to actually use something like that. For us, we don't, we don't keep heating blankets on our, uh, on our bodies nor on our, uh, nor on our tanks. Anyway, so the point is, is that you can add refrigerant with the system uh, off if it's under vacuum, if it's flat, right? And there are cases where you'd want to do that. So. When we, th when we think about overcharge, what is the primary reason why somebody would overcharge a system? Uh, could be an accumulator. So we actually talked about that recently. If your system has an accumulator, where, where, where's the accumula accumulator located? Right before the compressor. Yeah, it's located right in here, right before the compressor. And so it's after where we're putting refrigerant in. And so this accumulator is you know, basically a tank, can store liquid refrigerant so it doesn't go straight back into the compressor. And if we add into our suction line, it gets in that accumulator. The accumulator gets cold. The refrigerant has to boil out first. So it actually takes a while before it ends up cycling around. So that could be one reason. What are some other reasons why somebody might overcharge a system? Impatience. Impatience, that's a big one. So not waiting for the system to run long enough. 
it's cold outside, you have low ambient conditions, uh, and so the technician's not seeing the readings they're used to, and they start adding refrigerant, that's one. What else? Could be low airflow, that's a big one. So, but what is the, th there's really, I would say two main reasons why people a add too much refrigerant. They think it's low when it's really a metering device issue. Could be, could be an issue with the metering device causing them to think it's low, but why do they think it's low? What is the indicator they're looking at that's making them think it's low? Just suction, suction pressure, right? They're looking at suction pressure. And the point that I wanna drive home is that suction pressure is not the way by itself is not the way that you know that a system is low. Okay, this is, this is the thing that I wanna get you to understand, especially for newer techs. Suction pressure is not the way. It's like Mandalorian, but opposite. Suction pressure is not the way, sorry. Mandalorian reference, at least got it, you know? Hey, the other reason why people tend to overcharge a system is because they don't use a scale. Because if you use a scale, you're gonna have a pretty good indication when you're really starting to put too much refrigerant in it. A mild, underchar a mild overcharge you could do even with a scale, but you're not gonna overcharge it way, way, way too much when you're using a scale. So if you have a little patience, you use a scale, and you're not just looking at suction pressure, it's very unlikely that you're going to massively overcharge a system. It might be a little bit here or there, but it's not gonna be massive. So we gotta let our system run. When we start it up, or what's a kind of a standard amount of time that we should let it run before we start adding or removing charge? Yeah, you know, we'd say 20 usually if it's a brand new system, but yeah, you know, 10 minutes at least. If you do a maintenance, something like that, what's another thing that you gotta wait on? Coil dry. Gotta wait on your coil to dry. So if you wash the condenser coil, it's gotta run long enough that the condenser coil dries out before you can test it, which is why a lot of people do their testing before they wash the coil. I don't love that because, you know, the coil could have been pretty dirty, but if you know the coil's really not that dirty, you can look at it and see that it's not that dirty. It's okay to do your readings beforehand because it does save that whole step. Does that make sense? You, know, you understand what I'm saying there? Okay. If you walk up to a system and the condenser coil is clearly really bad, or you tested it and then you pulled it apart and you saw that it was really bad, now you're going to want to retest after you've actually washed it. So, but you do got to wait for it to dry. So it's usually some version of not having the right tool, impatience, or misunderstanding your readings. But let's understand what happens when we do overcharge a system. What are the actual symptoms of a system overcharge? What? Bird is really on this like not running full stage, uh, you know, thing. I think this has happened. Have you guys done this to him, where you don't run a system at high stage, mm -hmm. and you're testing it? Very naughty. Very naughty. Have there, have there been? No, oh, it's actually a common overcharge. Common in, overcharge. In infinity system. Somebody added charge without running it in full stage, so they're looking at the sub tool trying to get it up to ten, and it's not even running in full stage. Okay, so I'm going to learn to repeat the things that people say so that way it actually ends up because that's a good one. Running a, or, or trying to set the charge when the system is not at high stage. That's the way I would say that because if you've got a two-stage system, that may be second stage. It could be a five-stage. It could be, you know, whatever. And so that's why when we are charging a system like an Infinity, we need to go into the installer setup and make sure to force it into its highest stage. If it's a five-stage system, what stage do we have to run it in to set the charge? The fifth stage, right? 100% capacity. And because what is that doing when we when we run it at high stage? What is actually happening in the system when we run it in high stage? Ramps what ramps up? Compressor. Compressor, right? Compressor and blower should be running at full speed. When we're in dehumidification mode, what does the system generally do? The Drops the fan speed, but the compressor still runs at higher speed. Which what's that do to your suction pressure? Drops it, right? So if you have a compressor that's not running in high stage, what does that do to your readings? If it's running in a lower stage? Compressor's running in a lower stage. Go. Lower readings. So you're generally going to see lower head pressure, higher suction pressure. That's typically what you're gonna see because that, you know, we talked last week about compression ratio. The more that compressor is pumping, the more refrigerant is pumping, the more it creates separation between suction pressure and head pressure. If that compressor is running slower or in a lower stage, and they all do it a little differently, how they stage. But with modern inverter compressors, they actually run slower. It's not going to compress as much, which means your head pressure is going to be lower and your suction pressure is going to be higher. Make sense? So if that's happening, you're not moving as much refrigerant, obviously that's going to affect your readings and you can't set your charge that way. So that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Make sure that the thing is running at high stage before you're testing it. But let's say we are testing it 
and we just start, we're, we're, you know, we're running on a high stage, and we just start adding refrigerant to the suction line. We add more and more refrigerant to the suction line. What happens to that refrigerant? It goes into the compressor, right? Compressor compresses it, pushes it into the condenser, and then eventually it hits the metering device. And the way to think about the metering device is the metering device backs up that refrigerant. So it comes out of the metering device here as what? What does it come out as? Flash gas. That's one word for it. Does anybody know my favorite phrase to use? What do, what do, what do I call it uh, with the refrigerant that's coming out of the metering device and going into the evaporator coil? Boiling refrigerant. Because that's what it is. Flash gas just means boiling refrigerant. It's in the process of boiling. And I like using that phrase because when we think boiling initially, you think, oh, the boiling is hot. I want you to get over that. I want you to get over the emotion that initially tells you that boiling is hot, unless you're dealing with boiling hot water and then you'll burn your hand. So don't do that. Just get over it though, right? <laughs> you're fine, you're, you're fine. Um, yeah, so boiling refrigerant, flash gas, whatever you want to call it. And what is the goal of the evaporator coil as far as feeding it with refrigerant? What, is, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to regulate superheat, which is to say what? What is, a, what is another way of saying regulate superheat? We're trying to fill the evaporator coil with boiling refrigerant as much as we can without running the risk of liquid coming down the suction line, right? We want to fill this thing up with boiling refrigerant, but we want it to just, just at the end for there to be some superheat because then that tells us that it's fully vapor. That's what superheat tells us. Superheat's just telling us if we have 10 degrees of superheat, that's saying it picked up 10 degrees of temperature past the point of it being fully boiled off. Can't be superheated unless it's no longer, there's no longer any liquid. So that's what that number's telling us. Lower number means evaporative coil more full. Higher number means evaporative coil less full, right? That's it. But if we are adding more refrigerant and it's going through our condenser, you know, and again, it's feeding in the top and going out the bottom, so I didn't, I didn't do that great. And it comes in here down our liquid line, it's going to start backing up against this metering device because what is the typical metering device that we use on most of the equipment? The vast majority of the equipment we work on, what's the metering device? TXV, right? Sometimes you'll see an electronic expansion valve, we see very few fixed orifices anymore. So with that, regardless of whether it's an electronic expansion valve or whether it's a thermostatic expansion valve, the job here is to feed the evaporator coil with the right amount of refrigerant. So it doesn't care how much liquid is backing up against it, it's still gonna throttle in order to try to make sure that that evaporator coil is fed properly. So what happens if the pressure increases over here? So if the pressure on this side, this is what we call the high side over here, the pressure over here increases up against that metering device, what's the metering device gonna do in order to maintain the feeding of the evaporator coil? It's gonna close down, it's gonna throttle, right? it's gonna throttle because it doesn't wanna let any more refrigerant get into that evaporator coil. So what's gonna happen? Well, refrigerant's just gonna keep backing up. Liquid refrigerant's gonna back up, back up, back up in our condenser coil. And so when liquid refrigerant backs up in our condenser coil, what does that do to the area that the refrigerant can condense? So more and more liquid is stacking and it goes from the bottom up. So as we stack liquid into that condenser coil, what does that do to the effective condensing area? We've talked about this in a few classes recently. It, it gets smaller and smaller, right? So the efficiency decreases, our head pressure increases because now there's less area for refrigerant to condense. The condenser becomes more full of liquid, packed full of liquid, and it has less area for it to condense. So what happens? Head pressure goes up. So what are our symptoms? Well, our, our two main symptoms of system overcharge are high head pressure and high subcool. And that's really it. So it doesn't matter if our suction pressure is too low. Adding more refrigerant if our head pressure is high and our subcool is high, that's not gonna help anything. All that's gonna happen is we're just gonna stack more and more refrigerant in that condenser. The problem is, is that with modern condensers, have you noticed, I mean, anybody who's worked for a while, have you noticed what's happened to the size of condensers? They've gotten bigger, right? Generally speaking. A couple models, they've figured out ways to make them smaller, but generally speaking, they're bigger. They have more surface area. So that means that we can pack more and more refrigerant in them suckers than we used to be able to. So you're adding it and you're not necessarily seeing this quick rise in head and subcool like we used to. You add in an accumulator, like you mentioned, that makes it even worse. So we're adding refrigerant, adding refrigerant, nothing's happening. Have you ever had that happen? You're adding refrigerant, nothing's happening. 
Well, what's actually happening? It's either getting stuck in the accumulator or it's just packing in the condenser and it's not, it's not because it has so much volume that change in filling the condenser isn't showing up in your readings. But that's what's happening because when you're adding refrigerant, it's going somewhere. And if your suction pressure is not coming up, all that means is this metering device thro is throttling because it's trying to keep the same amount of refrigerant in the evaporator coil. So results are, the realities are, when you have low suction pressure, it could be low on charge, but that's, that's why we look to our head pressure and our subcool and our superheat and everything else. And if this tells us that we're not low on charge, then don't keep adding charge. The problem is either a restriction or airflow, and airflow being the more common of the two. If you have low airflow going over your evaporator coil, that means that there's less heat going into your evaporator coil, which means your suction pressure is going to drop. Your evaporator temperature is going to drop because it requires heat to boil the refrigerant out of that evaporator coil. Overcharge, pay attention to these. Use a scale, be patient, make sure it's in high stage. If you have an accumulator, especially be patient. It's gonna take a little longer for that refrigerant to make it out of the accumulator and then circulate back through the system before it makes it all the way around again. We look at all of our readings. We look at our suction pressure, otherwise known as our evaporator temperature, suction saturation. We look at our head pressure, otherwise known as our condensing temperature. We look at our subcool, we look at our superheat. Those are our main refrigerant readings that we focus on. Then you can also look at some other things. You know, we talk about static pressure measurement in order to help diagnose airflow problems. Um, you look at uh, things like delta T or total delivered capacity to give us some of the air side measurements. But what I don't want you to do is see low suction pressure and start adding refrigerant to it. What I don't want you to do is say, eh, it just looks a little low, let's start adding refrigerant without using a scale. Because especially when you're newer, you don't have a sense of how much refrigerant you're putting in unless you are using a scale. You just don't. So you're like, oh, I think I put in a couple ounces. Well, you may have put in a couple pounds. And that system may only hold six pounds. And now you're significantly overcharged. If you do those things, you're not going to get into trouble. It's when you get impatient, especially when you follow the habits that you see senior techs follow when they get impatient and they get in a hurry. They're like, ah, this is just, it's just a little bit. I'm just going to add it. I mean, we need to move on. We need to get to the next call. The schedule's backing up. That's when bad habits start to get established, and that's when you start overcharging systems. Anything else I should add, Bert, Sam? Yes. Go ahead. The difference between a claw transfer coil and overcharge in your readings with the line temperature. Yeah, so clogged condenser coil is going to result in high head pressure and can actually also result in high subcool. It's, it is one of the trickier things. Um, now, the nice thing with clogged condenser coils is that in most cases, you can visually see in residential equipment, but not in all cases, uh, because things can have certain you know, types of soil isn't necessarily visible on the outside, but also, and this is a really key point, sometimes condensers are multi-row, meaning you have more than one row stacked on top of each other, and especially in commercial, if you the certain rooftop package units, you can't clean it unless you actually split the coil apart. Like I, I, there was a job that I was chasing for so long because my head pressure was elevated, capacity was low, because when you have really high head pressure, systems don't work as well. And it ended up being that there was a lot of dirt inside the two coils. So there are cases where you have to go to pretty great lengths to even wash a condenser. But what you will see is elevated head pressure and you will see elevated liquid line temperature as well. So you're, that's what we call approach. So approach is the difference between your liquid line temperature and your outdoor temperature. That's literally just taking your liquid line, like this guy up here, measuring the temperature, comparing it to outdoor temperature. On average, your that's going to be you know, in the range of 5 to 15, in somewhere in there, differential. So meaning your liquid line temperature is going to be 5 to 15 degrees warmer than the outdoor temperature. Generally more 5 to 10 with modern equipment. That might have been... Correct. If it's overcharged, that's going to be close to your outdoor temperature-ish. You can actually elevate it a little bit, but, but, but ish. If it's 20, 25, 30 degrees higher than your outdoor temperature, then that's an indication of a dirty condenser coil. And really, the way you're generally going to do this is you're going to grab the liquid line. Right? That's the, kind of the first indication. You walk up to a system and you throw your hand over the top of the condenser and it's blowing really hot air out, and you grab that liquid line and it's hot, Airflow, condenser airflow. That's, that's what you're going to notice first. If it was overcharged, you may get hot air coming out the top when you grab the liquid line. It's not going to be hot. 
it's not going to be that much hotter than the outdoor temperature. Does that sound right to everybody? Any disputes on that? Sam, any questions about that? Now again, that's not the technical way of doing it. The technical way is using what we call the approach <laughs> method, comparing liquid line temperature to outdoor temperature. Um, but then again, good old fashioned visual inspection, you know, when in doubt, wash it, that kind of thing. I mean, those are, those are things that are just good practices. Um, and again, you know, looking for, looking for factors that could affect that. So you've got a dryer vent that's sitting right next to the condenser. You know, it may be clean on this side, but pull the side panel off where the dryer vent is. It's probably gonna be completely plugged. Just being, you know, using common sense. Uh, is also also a big factor. What else? So summarize, don't charge by suction pressure. Be more patient. Use a scale. Recognize that head pressure and subcooling being elevated are your primary indicators of overcharge. And like Bert said, make sure that you're running on high stage and um, look at that approach or that liquid line temperature compared to outdoor temperature to help you differentiate between a dirty condenser coil and an overcharge condition. Cool? Awesome, have a great week. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.